Yeah, good luck being after the good-looking French neuroscience guy. <laughs> um, with luck being mentioned as a word, I have to confess that I feel that I am one lucky guy. And this is because I lost my father when I was 17. And allow me to explain. My father was 52 when I was born, and he was a writer. He had this writer's eye. You know, he could see things that weren't really there. And he'd say his stuff, and then I would sometimes remember it, and stuff like we shouldn't use exquisite metaphors when we lie, because people might remember the lie. Or since he lived long after 1989, and he was born before the Second World War, he would say that life is not meant for you to, remember, to, to live through two revolutions. That's one too many for a human. And you could see my father was my hero, which I guess is normal for a boy. And it's a thought that a bit scares me a bit, because I have a boy at home. Um, there was this one night and one conversation that, that sort of shaped my life. We had this, my uncle had this amazing, beautiful old Turkish house in the middle of the Rose Valley in the Rosino, smack in the middle of it, absolutely gorgeous. And it's, it is something like 2 a.m. and everyone's asleep but my father. And he's sitting on this huge terrace and overlooking two, two walnut trees the size of, I don't know, Alexander Nevsky or something. And he's smoking and I cannot see the red stuff of the cigarettes, but I can only hear him smoking. It's like And then he breathes a bit, and then he once again. And to give you a bit of a context, I'm around 12, I'm 13. I am understanding what hormones can do to a body. Um, and it is, it is only about me at the time. It's about my friends, my school, my football game, my whatever. Philosophy is a foreign concept. Screw that. And in this world, in this middle of Rosino thing, I'm laying there at 2 a.m. I don't know why, for God's sake, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm awake. And he's sitting out there. There's this tiny little window in between him and me. And I ask him, Dad, what, what on earth possesses you to be outside at this ungodly hour? And he didn't even think about it. He just turned around and said, I'm thinking of death and life. And how they are inextricably linked. And how death makes us who we are. And I'm curious what death will make you be after I'm gone. And from then on, every single time that we were celebrating something at home, be it a birthday or whatever, my father would say, hey, today was beautiful, it was a great celebration, and let us remember it for long, because soon I might not be around. And my mother and I would be, Doc, for Christ's sake, could just cut it all right. And every single time. And we were grumpy every time. And then he died, February 23rd, 2000. I was 17. I had just lost my, he my hero, sorry. But I already had closure. I was prepared. I was guided by my father. I was nurtured. I felt like I was hugged by him, although he wasn't around to hug me. And Later, growing up in our beautiful country, I remember comparing what I had with other families. And so life brought me to this very dear person uh, of mine when she lost her mother to cancer. And like everywhere else, death was a taboo at her, at her place. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. It's not there. It is not there until her mother died. And it's now been six or seven years since her mother died. And cancer is still a subject that brings her to tears 10 seconds in the conversation. And 
for that matter, the memory of her mother brings her to tears 10 seconds later. And she is not guilty. She, I know it, she doesn't want the tears. It's simply a reaction of having to deal with the unknown, with that black stuff that hangs over there that nobody speaks about. And in this journey towards closure, she's alone. She doesn't have someone to guide her, to nurture her. Now, I am sure that when I speak of my friends' accounts, you're all seeing the deaths around you, and you're dissecting your own experiences. There is this Nancy Updike in the This American Life radio show calls it a hidden geography, the this death leads to another death that aren't really related. And you know, I'm a, I, I have this kid who's about to turn four, and when he was about to be born, we talked and we read and we prepared for him to be born, how that would change the lives that we had. And we, not that we weren't scared after he was born, but we were guided, we were prepared. And why is it that we don't prepare ourselves for the same, in the same manner for death? Why is it that we think it's better not to think of the unthinkable? Daniel Barenboim, this, the, the uh, conductor and amazing pianist, he has this, the greatest definition of the phenomenon of sound that I'm, that I'm yet to read. It's how he defines sound by the silence before it and after it. And silence, he says, is not unlike the law of gravity. It sucks and pulls all sounds until the memory of the sound remains, and that's the only thing left. And I think that metaphor is incredibly apt for death and dying. Death defines us, it provides the context that we exist in, and sets up the landscape for how we will be remembered. And if we talk about death, if we put the effort to see it, to recognize it, to at least try to understand it, we might as well just come to terms with it. For death, I think, is a beautiful part of life. And as my father once told us, and I have to be honest here, my mother still thinks that my father nicked the line, he didn't come up with it, but I'll leave that to her. My father said that no one ever died before they wanted to. And think of that for a moment. Put it on your own geographical map of deaths. Try to see whether my father was right, whether really people don't die before they want to. I, for one, am sure that when my father died in 2000, he did wish it at the very end. And, to an extent, I believe he did because he prepared us. Because he knew that we will be all right. So yes, I think I am one lucky guy. And here's to more lucky people. And please, let's talk about death. Thanks.